Good morning, everyone. For those who don't know, so I'm Jean Baptiste, so I'm French. And so I uh, already apologize if this morning my brain thinks quicker than my mouth can speak English. <laughs> I try to, to manage that. Today I wanted to challenge us with uh, a question. You know, how do you see God? Well, more than one question. Is he close or far away when you think about him? Where does he live? Where can you meet him? That's the most important. You know, in paintings, you would often see God seated on a throne in the skies, you know, in heaven, and you would see humans painted on earth. So that seems quite far away. And that's how most people see where God lives, you know. It would be like if God had created the earth, and at some point in history, he would got bored go back in the sky and do some other important stuff. And many, many people would say that, you know, that they acknowledge that there might be a God. But where they see the state of the earth, they would say, you know, he can't be interested in us. He's somewhere maybe, he's far away, but does he really care about us? And today I want to, to see what the Bible says about that. Does the Bible paint a God that is far away? What does the Bible give us another answer? So today we'll go through quite a lot of Bible readings, but no worries, it will all be on the screen for you to read. And so as we begin this exploration, we'll begin at the beginning in Genesis. And so as Genesis begins, God creates the earth and everything that is in it. And as the pinnacle of his creation, God created human beings. And if we go to Genesis 1, 26 and 28, God created man. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. And if we go to Genesis 2, 7 to 10 and then 15, God creates Adam in the garden of Eden. Then God, the Lord formed the man from the dust on the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four waters. And then verse 15, Then the Lord took, God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And then if we read a bit later, God creates Eve for man not to be alone. And so well, there's the scriptures, but we'll go forward. And so God puts men and women in the Garden of Eden to look after the garden. That was the original plan for men and women to be in the garden. Then we all know that there's the form, and we'll see what happens after that. Genesis is 3, 8 and 9. The man, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? I don't know if you realize that when, when we read it. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. How amazing does it sound, you know? The original plan of God was for men and women to live in the Garden of Eden in His presence. You know? That was God's address at the, at the time. Of course, God is infinite, He was also everywhere else, but in the Garden of Eden, there was God's presence. They could hear it, they could see it, they could talk with God. God asked them directly, where are you? 
and we know that after the men and women respond to it. That was the original plan for you and me, to live in God's presence, with no suffering, no sin, just His presence, and working in the garden. That sounds amazing, and that's still plan, God's plan for humanity. But of course the form changed everything. And of course, men and women were pushed out of the garden because God's presence cannot allow sin. And so, from then on, what is the purpose for our lives? We can't go back to the Garden of Eden in God's presence. So, where was God, God's address after that? Where can we go to meet Him? And so after the fall, there is a long time where you wouldn't see a place where God's presence dwell. God would appear to people like Cain, Noah and Abraham and, and talk to them, but there was no special place where they could go and be sure to find God's presence. So, I'm going to jump to Exodus 3, verse 5 and 6, where there's a place where there's God's presence. And so God speaks to Moses, it's the account of the burning bush. And God says, do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now this Moses hid his face, because if he was afraid to look at God. And here we see another place where there was God's presence. It wasn't there all the time, but at this point, there was God's presence. It's a bit like a clue that God wants to restore a place of his presence among his people. And you know the story about Moses, he drives the, Egypt, the Israelites out of Egypt and then they go into wander into the desert. At some point they reach Mount Sinai, another place of God's presence, and Moses goes at the top and receives the Ten Commandments and many other laws and regulations for the people of God to follow. And among these instructions, there are very detailed instructions to build a tabernacle. In Exodus 25, verse 8 and 9, God says, Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. And in the verses that follows, you have very, very detailed instructions about the materials, the designs, the objects that were to be in the tabernacle. And the Israelites built that. And we see that from God's words, it was a place where, where he was preparing himself to dwell. So another place for his presence. And if we skip to Exodus 39, verse 42, the Israelites had done all the work just as the Lord commanded Moses. In Exodus 40, verse 33 to 38, then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and altar and put up the curtain at the entrance of the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the Israelites during all their troubles. And so here we see that God, there was so much of God in the tabernacle that they could not go in. So God really, the presence of God was so real, so tangible, that there was no more space. And so here we see the plan of God to restore His presence among His people in the tabernacle. Of course it was, it was a bit, uh, I would say it's a bit, uh, it was not complete because they could, these, the regular people could only go in the courtyard and only the priests could go in the tabernacle, be into God's presence with all a set of regulations. But still, if you went to the tabernacle, you were sure to find God's presence at this time. This was one of God's address on earth. And so the tabernacle continues until the time of King David. And we speak to Samuel 7, 1-2. 2. 
after the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. David had built himself a palace and he thought that it was relevant for God to live in a tent as long as the people were nomads. And now that they were in Jerusalem, he had a palace, people had houses, he thinks that it was appropriate to build God a proper house. And I like God's response in 2 Samuel 4, 7. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says, Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelled in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people, why have you not built me a house of cedar? So I love God's response. It's a bit ironic, you know? But we know that he says to David, okay, you can go ahead. And he prepares the, the, the material for the temple, but his son Solomon needs to build it. And again, if you read the passages, there's many and many, many instructions about the, the details, the designs, the material used, exactly like the tabernacle. And we can read when the, ark is, the temple is finished and that the ark is bringing in, in 1 Kings 8, verse 10 to 12. When the priest withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could, no, could not perform their service because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled his temple. And then Solomon said, The Lord had said that he will dwell in a dark land. And here again, we see the transition from the tabernacle to the temple. And when the ark is brought in, again, the presence of God is so physically present that they had to go out because there was no more room inside. And so from then on, God's address was in the temple. And that was was Jerusalem was so precious and the temple was so precious to the Jews because if they went there, they, was, they were sure to find God's presence. And we know that the temple was destroyed after that by the Babylonians, it was rebuilt and then redestroyed by the Romans in, 17, in 70 AD. And so from then on, there's no more temple. So where can we go? to find God. Where, where can we go to find God's presence? There's no more special place. There have not been since 70 AD. But there's a shift in history, you know? Like many other things, there's a shift in one person, in one life. And of course, that's the life of Jesus. Jesus came between the two, the two destructions of the temple. So there was the second temple. But Jesus came to fulfill the old covenant and to bring a new one. And as Jesus was going to, to be crucified, he, he told his disciples, and you can read in John 14, verse 5 to 10. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do, not, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. And here is an amazing teaching about Jesus, you know. Philip is saying, show us the Father and that will be enough, you know. We just need to see his presence and that's it. We, we will have seen everything, which is true. But Jesus says, I've been here with you for quite a few years now. And you still don't see the Father. And the Father was in Jesus, and Jesus was in the Father. During Jesus' lifetime, where can you see 
God, when, where could you meet with God? If you met Jesus, you would met God. Jesus says, the words I speak, it's the Father speaking them. And what I do is what I see the Father doing. When you spoke to Jesus, the Father would speak to you. And what Jesus did, all the miracles, it was the Father doing them freely. And so during Jesus' lifetime, the place to meet with God was Jesus. It was no longer a place, a physical place. You didn't need to travel to Jerusalem. You just needed to meet Jesus. And can you see that turning point? There's not a building of stone. It's a person. But then we all know that Jesus was crucified. And then there's no more place. We can't go in Israel to meet Jesus in person. So today for us, where can we meet God? Where can we find God's presence? We'll read in John 15 to find out what Jesus says to us. I am the true vine, and my Father is the one God. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and every one that does, he prunes so that it bears more fruit. You are already pruned because of the word that I spoke to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me, and I in him, will bear much fruit. Because without me, you can do nothing. And one who does not remain in me, will be thrown out like a branch and wither. People will gather them and throw them into a fire, and they will be burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want, and it will be done for you. But by this is my Father, by this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father loves me, so I also love you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. There's something coming back and back again in this teaching, you know, like if Jesus was really wanting us to get it, you know, if he would have said it, said it one time, Maybe it was skipped, maybe two times you could have skipped it. But over and over again, he says, remain in me. Remain in me. If we follow to John 17, 20 to 26, Jesus says, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me, and that you, you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. They can see all the glory you gave me, because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you th to them, and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. And so here again, Jesus brings two ideas. Us to remain in him. He is the vine and we are the branches. And if we are not in him, we are not really living. And Jesus being in us. How amazing. Jesus says, and I will be in them. How is that possible? Like God the Father was in Jesus and Jesus was in the Father, we are called to be in Jesus and Jesus to be in us. Like this through Jesus we can access God's presence. Remember, Jesus was in the Father and the Father was in Jesus. How amazing. How, how is that possible that Jesus can dwell in us as we are just humans? On the cross, Jesus took our sins so that we can be cleansed. Jesus died so that we can live. Jesus suffered so that we can be healed. 
Jesus was killed so that we can be blessed. That's already a lot, but is that all that happened on the cross? Now if you look to Jesus' words on the cross, in Matthew 27, 45 and 46. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. But three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lema, Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did Jesus say that at this point? Darkness over the land means that God has left. His presence was no longer there. There was no more sun. And Jesus' words confirmed that. Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? At this point, where Jesus died, he took all our sins and the Father could no longer look at him. For the first time in the whole history since creation, and even before, Jesus was separated from God's presence. God's own son was separated from his Father for the first time. Why? So that you and I could access God's presence. He was rejected so that we can be accepted by God. And so as God was turning his face away, we were getting adopted. And that is the turning point for accessing God's presence. Jesus paid it all for us to access God's presence. And if, I won't read it, but the veil in the temple confirms that, you know, between the holy place and the most holy place where God's presence was, there was a big and thick curtain, very high, and it was torn from top to bottom, which means that it wasn't a disciple that torn it, because he would have needed a ladder, he would have had to access the temple. It was torn from top to bottom, which means when Jesus died, God's presence was no longer to be kept behind the curtain, but it was to be accessible to all that believed in Jesus. And so now you, as a believer, and we as a church, are the place of God's presence. No need to go to a special place, or to meet a special person, who can access God's presence wherever you are. And later on, the Apostle Paul expands upon this truth. In Colossians 1, 1, 27, he says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? In 1 Corinthians 6.16, 19. Do you, you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. So if you want to know God's address, look inside of you. Look in this room. So what are we to do with, with that, with this fact that God's presence is among us? First of all, have you welcomed him? Have you allowed him to enter? Because of course God's presence is available, but have you welcomed it? Or are you keeping him on the doorstep of your heart, on the doorstep of your life? God never imposes himself. He asks, he knocks on the door. If you have welcomed him, how often do you stop during your day to consider and fully realize that God is present with you and in you? He's there, always there. But how often do I stop to talk to him, to realize that he's here? In my marriage, if we would only speak once a day quickly before bedtime, I'm not sure that our relationship will be really healthy. For a healthy relationship, for a close bond, we need time together. Time to speak, time to listen, to share things, share joys, joys, challenges. That's the same with God. If we don't share, of course God knows everything, but if we don't take time to share with Him, and to take time to listen for what He has to say to us, there's no relationship. He's there, but there's no relationship. I'm a physiotherapist. If a patient comes 
and he doesn't say to me what he has, he doesn't give me this prescription, we'll be in the same room, but nothing will be happening. I wouldn't be allowed, uh, allowed to help him. And that's the same with God, he's there, he's always there. But are we allowing him a place in our hearts? And so, I want to challenge us a bit. We'll take a, a couple of minutes just to, to reflect on that. And I want you, if you haven't welcomed him, maybe it's the time to welcome him, to realize that he's present, that he wants to dwell in your heart. If you have already welcomed him, and to challenge us to regularly during the day acknowledge his presence and just by a simple phrase, you know, like ah, ah that you are here oh, it's so good, Lord, that you are here and how would it change our lives just to acknowledge his presence so many people were separated didn't have an experience of it for themselves and yet each one of us can not just temporarily not just once a year not through journeying halfway across the world but by living each day with the gift that you've given us and so we pray Holy Spirit that you would continue to work in our hearts and lives that we would pause and reflect, acknowledge you, be with you, live in the fullness of that. And so we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.